Good morning. Turn to your neighbor, look at their name tag. Hopefully you already know their name because maybe they're family. And say, good morning, and fill in the blank with their name. What a great day to be in church. One of my favorite Sundays of the year when you get to sleep in that extra hour. It's like, praise God. I don't need two Red Bulls before I preach. I just need one now. Like, I got an extra hour of sleep. We're good to go. It's a great day. It's, isn't it crazy that it's, it's November already? It's November. It's the time's changing. The seasons are changing. It's time to vote. So make sure you go out this week and you pray and you vote. Uh, it's, it's starting to look a little bit like it's Christmas season. Where are my Christmas people at? Like, you're already getting ready for Christmas. All right, tell the truth, shame the devil. Who's got a Christmas tree up already in your house? You got a Christmas tree up? There's a couple. I'm gonna be honest with you, you might hate me. We put ours up yesterday. We did, we did. My wife was like set on it. She's like, it's, it's time. It's November, it's time for the Christmas tree to go up. Uh, it doesn't look great though, because our kids did all the decorating of the tree. So there's about this far up on the tree, there's a lot of ornaments. And then they brought the stool over, so about this far up on the tree, there's a lot of ornaments. There's just two rows of ornaments ready to go on the tree, and it's, it's set up in the hill house, ready to go. It's Christmas time. Turn to your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Hopefully that was the first Merry Christmas you've said all year, but it's, it's looking like Christmas a little bit. Man, I'm so excited uh, to be in church this morning. What a great church to be a part of. All the things that are going on, the Operation Christmas Child boxes that are starting to show up. It's a, it's a good family to be a part of. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're my family. You're my family. Maybe they already were your family and you were just reminding them so you got in an argument in the car ride on the way here, like, you're my family still. Maybe it's someone you've never met before and now you're like, I got a new cousin, that's cool, that's cool. We're family, we're family. It's, it's fun to be a part of a church where there's a lot going on, where there's Sunday school happening. I talk to a lot of people and Sunday school is not a common thing that's happening, but here at New Hope, we, we value learning the Bible. We value that, we value that for the kids, for the teenagers, for, for you personally to go through the Bible. I encourage you, hop into a, a Sunday school class. Find some, some class to get plugged into. You don't have to like start when the class starts. Jump in today and, and it'll be good for you. It's good to be a part of a church where there's stuff happening. Maybe you don't know there's another service happening just down the hallway. It's, there's a lot happening at New Hope. It's a good time to be plugged into God's house, amen? Amen. I'm excited as we're continuing a series. It's weird that we're already in part four of this series in Genesis. Uh, it, doesn't, it feels like we just started it, but we're in part four today. Week one, we looked at God creating the world, and, and when God speaks, something happens. And out of nothing, God created something. And maybe in your life, you've been asking God for something, and it feels like there's nothing there, but I want to remind you this morning that when God speaks, something happens. He can create, he, he can form with just his voice. And, and we saw that God did that. We saw that God made mankind in his own image, that the person next to you, the, the person in front of you, behind you, that you are made in the image of God. You have that value that, that God made you. We saw last week, looking at the Sabbath, that the seventh day God rested, man's first day on earth was spent resting with God. And maybe that challenged you a little bit this week. You know, I, I think too often we wear like the badge of I'm busy as like, like, we're proud of it. Like, I'm busy. I got a lot to do. I'm going nonstop. I saw someone's license plate. Hopefully, it's not someone from here the other day. And it just said, busy. Like, that was just their license plate. And I thought, man, they need, to, they need to learn how to Sabbath a little bit. Like, if you're taking it to that level that your license plate is labeling you as busy. But today, we're in part four. And, and we see that we've gone through all the, the days of creation up to this point. But we see that God is not done creating yet. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 2. If you don't know where that is, open up the cover and turn about four pages, and there you are. Genesis chapter 2. We're starting in verse 18. God's done all this creating. There's still some creating to do, and I'll be reading from the NLT version. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be what? For man to be what? Alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals, but still there was no what? There was no what? There's way more people in here than what just said that right now. Still there was no what? Helper. Now you got me to lose my spot. Here we go. Where were we at? 
There was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed. Maybe that was some men in here when you saw your bride walking down the aisle. You're like, at last. This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother in his what? Joined, united with his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked but felt no shame. Let's pray. God, I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you that you're speaking today. I thank you that as you formed in Genesis that you're still forming today. I thank you uh, for what you've given me to say. I pray you'd speak through me, take stuff out that needs to go out, put stuff in that needs to go in. We thank you that you're a good God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we see that God did all of this creating. He did all this creating. Day one, he created it. And what did he say when he was done creating? It was good. Day two, it was good. Three, good. Four, good, good. Day six, he created man. And what did he say? It is very good. Turn your hand and say, you're very good. You're very good. It's good, it's good, it's good. It's, It's very good. And now here's God looking at good, looking at very good, looking at this perfect creation. And he looks at it, and what does he say? Something here is not good. It's, it's not good. It's, it's a perfect world. It's, it's a perfect creation. He doesn't mess up, but he's looking at it and saying, something here is not good. What was not good? It was not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. What was not good about Adam's solitude? Think about this. It's, it's a moment where it's, it's just Adam and God. It's Adam in the garden. It's, it's Adam with all the animals. It's Adam with all the food. All the food. Everything. It's, it's, it's this beautiful moment. But what was not good? God says there's not a helper that is just right. There were these animals. There, there was all this other stuff. And he parades them. He, he shows them all of them. But none of them are just right. None of them fit the need that Adam has. None of them, some versions say, are, there's no suitable helper for Adam. So what does God do? He creates Eve. He he gives him a wife. He needs this helper that is his wife. How many husbands in the room would uh, be honest this morning and say, you need the help of your wife? You need the help of your wife. Some of the husbands in the room this morning, you woke up this morning, your clothes were laid out for you. Like you just, you need that sort of help, all right? You know, I won't make you raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass you, but I know it's probably true in a room this size that some of you, you just need that much help. Some of you, if you didn't have your wife, it would be, peanut butter and jelly every day for the rest of your life. Like, that's just where you'd be at. You, like, revert back to college. Ramen noodles, peanut butter, and jelly. That's just it. Right? We need the help. How many wives in the room? You know that your husband needs your help. (laughs) Yeah, notice I didn't ask you if you need your husband's help. You just, you recognize, my husband needs me. He needs me. God recognizes, I, this, is, this is good. Everything I've made is, is good. It's, it's very good. It's, it's perfect. But this is not good. This is not good that Adam is alone. This is not good that Adam doesn't have any. But this is not good. This was not what I, what I need this to be. So God, he, he creates Eve. Out of Adam, he creates Eve. And I want you to notice something this morning, that Eve is not lesser than because she was created second. She wasn't less than because she was created out of Adam, but what we see is that they were both made in the image of God. The same God who made Adam in his image is now making Eve in his image. They're they're equal, They're, they're the same. They both are given dominion over creation. One is not lesser, one is not greater than the other. So we don't know, we don't know how long Adam was alone for. Maybe this was a day. Maybe this was weeks, maybe this was months, maybe this was, this was years where he was just spending this time searching for the animals uh, and, and just going about on his own. And we don't really know how this happened, but God gave Adam the job of naming all the animals. Anybody here ever had to like name a pet or name a child? Right? You, you, had, to name a, you had to name something. How many of oh, there's you some, There's some pressure that comes with naming somebody, right? Like when we're naming our kids, it's, you've got to think, how is some other kid going to make fun of them based off this name? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's the meanest kid? You're thinking back, Marin would throw out names. I'm like, no, I knew a person named that. We're not naming our kid that. 
no, that person was not it. Like, it, like there's just this, this pressure, there's this weight that comes with naming it. So God tells Adam, hey, you're gonna name all the animals. So he's going around and maybe they were just like being paraded by him and he's just like seeing them. It's like, you're an elephant, you're a lion. He's just like naming stuff. Or maybe, I like to picture it more like he's hunting for them, but he's not like hunting to kill, he's hunting to name them, right? Like something to get a look. And he's just like searching. And, and as he's seeing them, regardless of how this whole thing happened, he's seeing well, there's two elephants. Those elephants look alike. Those birds look alike. Those tigers look alike. Those monkeys look alike. And he's, he's recognizing, man, all of them have a companion. All of them have someone who, who looks like them, who, who talks like them, who, who acts like them. Are any of these good to, to help me? And, and no, the, the monkey wasn't good. The lion wasn't good. We know the birds wouldn't be good if you know me. My, birds are my biggest fear. No way would they be man's helper, okay? They're terrifying. They're, he's like, no, those can't be my helper. He's, he's looking and none of it was good. It's, it's not working out. It's, it's not what he wanted. So he's, he's searching. He starts wondering, man, maybe there's someone out there that looks like me. So now he's like, he's searching for the animals, but he's also searching for a wife. Like some of you, when you went to college, you were there and you're like, I'm here to get a PhD and an MRS. Like both of them are good with me. Right, and you're just on the hunt, and it was maybe not the healthiest thing that you did, but you were looking for a wife, or you were looking for a husband there. And this was Adam, and, he, and he's searching, and God recognizes this, this isn't good for him to be alone. He needs a helper. So God, he creates Eve. Notice that God did not make a mistake by not creating Eve at the very beginning. It wasn't like he made all the animals, he, he, he made everything in the world, and, and now he makes Adam, and he's going, oh, I messed up. I messed up, I, I, I didn't think it would end like this. No, God knew this. We're in chapter two when this happens. You go back to chapter one, and it says God made them in his image. He made them, say them. Them, he made male and female, he created them. God had a plan, he, he had a purpose with this. So what, what was God doing here? Why, why did it take Time, why did God not just create Adam and Eve right at the beginning together? Maybe it was because this, maybe it was to show Adam his need for God. Man, I, I, have, I have a need, I, I, my, my needs are being met, I, I, I don't have everything that I need, but you know who provides for me, it's God provides for me. It was to show that, that God's the one who provides for me. Maybe it was to show his need for another human being. Like maybe if it was Adam and Eve at the beginning, at some point he would have thought, man, I probably could have done this better myself. Like I could have done this easier myself. This would have been just as fine by just me and, and nobody else. No, he, he want, maybe he's wanting him to re realize I need another person. I need companionship. I need that helper that I love the Bible that's just right. Just right. Or maybe it was this. Maybe it was God wanting Adam to spend some extra time with him before someone else entered into the picture with him. How many, how many people in the room, married or single, you recognize that my relationship with God needs to be strong before my relationship with someone else can be strong? It, it needs to start there, and maybe you're here this morning and, and you're single, maybe by choice, maybe not by choice, and you find yourself single and you're just thinking, man, I, I just want someone, I just want someone that's good, I just want someone that, that loves Jesus. Can I encourage you this morning, all the married people, you'll agree with me this morning, that we need to focus on not just finding the right one, but becoming the right one. I don't, I don't just need to find the right person. Here's what I always tell students when they're, when they're looking, when it's like young adult, college age type students, I tell them this. Are you the, pers the person of your dreams, is the person of the dreams that you have, are you the person that they would marry? That person that, that loves Jesus, that person that seems to have everything together, are you the one that they're looking for? Are you being pure? Are, are you following God? It's, it's building that relationship with God first. And what you see is that as, as one person is here and one person is here and they both begin a relationship with Jesus, they grow closer together. It's closer to him and, and closer together. And maybe that's dating. Maybe that's someone in the room and, and you're married today and, and you find yourself drifting apart. Draw closer to Jesus and you draw closer together. He, he wants the relationship with him built strong. We, we don't really know how long, we don't really know why this happened, but what we see is that God had a plan, that God had a purpose, that, that God, he, he doesn't make mistakes. This morning, I want to I wanna talk just for a few minutes, not long, just maybe the next five or six hours this morning. 
trying to be more like Pastor Weaver. <laughs> the title of this morning's message, if you're taking notes, is this, is God's purpose for marriage. God's purpose for marriage. We see here in Genesis chapter two, we see the first marriage. We see Adam and Eve, the, the first marriage. What do we see when, when two people get married? We see that the two become, the two become one. The two, it's, it's two last names, now one last name. Two houses, now one house, now one apartment. Two, two bank accounts, now one bank account. Two debts, now one debt. Two hobbies, now, no, that probably stayed different. How many people in the room have a different hobby from your spouse? How many in the room, you're like, I don't even understand my spouse's hobby, right? You're like, maybe you're here, where, where are the people at, and your hobby is like cooking. You, you got a hobby of like cooking or baking, not too many, which means that there, if, if there was a hobby of cooking or baking, then the husband's hobby is probably gonna be eating. They're like, that's my hobby. I eat it all, right? Any, anybody, like, you have a hobby of, like, playing, playing a sport, playing a game. Uh, maybe it's creating, it's, it's building, it's, it's doing something, it's, it's sewing, it's, uh, I don't even know other things. I, I don't know. There's all sorts of hobbies. Turn to your neighbor and tell them your favorite hobby. Turn to your neighbor right now. Tell them your favorite hobby. Favorite hobby. Favorite hobby. Some of you are like, I already know what your favorite hobby is. You spend all our money on our favorite hobby. You know, I found that that there's all sorts of hobbies, there's all sorts of things, and you know, I got something up here for a hobby today. I, I should have thought of this before. Who could help me here? Who's, who's just feeling like, like you're feeling like you could be a, a helper that is just right? Daniel Murtha, you're the guy. You're the guy. Come on, Daniel. Come on, you're killing me, Smalls. All right, here we go. Right here. Daniel, do you have a hobby of Legos? Kind of. Kind of, there we go, then you are the right guy. Here I got, uh-oh, uh-oh, don't lose a piece. Here I got a, a, a whole pile of Legos for you. And uh, you know, we're talking through Genesis, we're talking through creating. This is your opportunity to be like God, okay. to create. I mean, you can't speak and create, obviously, but you can, you can build with your hands, so I want you, uh, Obviously, I forgot the, the instruction manual, but these pieces all are from one thing. They're all from one kit, and they all have a purpose. All of them should be used, so just take some time up here, and uh, there's an eye. I would guess that's used for an eyeball. But just go ahead, and you just start creating. He's already dropping pieces. This is a mess. <laughs> this is a mess. He's gonna create for a minute, but what we see is that the two get married. They're joined together, and now they become one, the two become one. God's purpose for marriage, if you're taking notes, this is the key this morning. God's purpose for marriage is this, that the two would be joined. That they'd be joined. We see that man leaves his wife, or leaves his, his father and mother to, to be joined to his wife, to be united as one. This, this word joined, it's, it's more than just joined by last name and joined by house and joined by bank account. It means to be joined in the most intimate way possible. It's to be joined. If this is God's purpose. Say joined. Joined. So if you're taking notes this morning, I want to look at three different ways, three different ways that we would be Join three different ways that it's God's purpose for marriage on how to be joined. And maybe you're single in here, and this is for you. Maybe you're, you're, you're searching, and this is for you. Maybe you're married, and this is for you. Newly married. Maybe you've been married for a long time. I want to encourage you that this is for you. Tug, tug your neighbor. Nudge him on the, on the arm and say, this is for you this morning. This is for you. The two would be joined. The first way that we see in marriage that two would be joined is this, is Emotionally. Emotionally. Two would be joined emotionally, and this is, this is through the, the soul. Verse 20 said, but still there was no helper just right for him. There wasn't a helper that was just right. It was, it was just Adam. No other physical person, no other human being. It was just Adam, total isolation. Just him, the garden, him, and the animals. Anybody in the room, you like just some alone time? You like just some time where you're just alone? Uh, if you've got young kids, you're probably like, yes, that sounds amazing, some alone time, right? Or if you've got a spouse, you're probably like, yes, some alone time sometimes sounds good. It sounds good, like alone time can be good, but to be here where there's 
total isolation, where it's alone time all the time, doesn't sound too great. You would start to go crazy. Anybody in the room think like you could go a day without seeing a person, talking to a person, and you'd be totally fine. You'd be totally fine. Anybody think like a week, you'd be fine. A week? A month? Yeah, but it's like slowly hands are going down. Like, I don't, I don't think I could last that. That's totally alone. You'd probably start going crazy. You become best friends with the volleyball. You name him Wilson, right? You get the picture. <laughs> like, total isolation, not the greatest. But here in Genesis, we see that it's, it's just Adam, that there was no one there. So God says it is not good. This is not good. It's not good that he's by himself. And this isn't like all of a sudden God realized this. God knew that this was the plan. Remember, God knows. His ways are higher, his plans are higher, his thoughts are higher. He already knew that this was gonna happen. He realized it's not good. So I'm gonna give him a helper that is just right. This word helper comes from the word Azar. Say Azar. Azar. It's, it's helper. It's, and sometimes in, in our culture today, we see helper as someone who's less than. Someone who's like, they're not as valuable, they're just my helper. Like, I, I'm the one who can do this and they're just, they're just helping me. They're just adding to what I'm already really good at. They're just, like you, like you talk to a toddler, like, oh, you're my little helper, right? Like, that's how we view this word helper, but we see helper here in Genesis almost every other time through the Bible when we see the word helper, it's referring to God. It's referring to God is the help, that, that he is your helper, that he sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is our, what? our helper, he's our helper. So it's easy to look at this and think, well, Eve is less than because she is the helper. But understand this, it does not define her worth, it defines her function. It's not her worth that, oh, she's just the helper. No, this is her function, this is what she's doing. She is helping. And it's not like coincidental that, that she shows up and now she can help. It's not incidental. Like, do you recognize that God is our helper? He has a plan, that, that he has a purpose, that he's working everything out and he wants you to need his help. I think sometimes in the room, we have a hard time asking for help, especially if you need directions somewhere. Like, it, anybody gotten in that type of an argument before, like needing directions? Now it's not as big of a thing because GPS. But sometimes we, we have a hard time asking for help. Oh, uh, I, can, I can figure it out. Uh, I, can, I can do it on my own. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll get it all. But I want you to know that God wants you to ask him for help. He wants, he wants that. He wants you to, to reach out. And people want you to ask them for help. How many in the room, if someone texted you in the room and said, hey, I need some help with this today, you'd be like, yeah, I'm more than willing to do it. We recognize that I'm willing to help other people, but we don't always think that people are willing to help me. We need other people. We see right here in Genesis, we need each other. Turn to the person behind you or in front of you and say, I need you. I need you. We need each other. We, we need help. So God, he, he creates Eve and, and she's the helper. And it's not just to, to make it where he's doing better at his job. It's to make it so he can survive at doing what he's doing. It's like a, a car that gets stranded on the side of the road. They're stranded out in the middle of nowhere it's late at night, they're in like the middle of the desert, they're, they're stranded, they, their car's not working. Who do they call? A tow truck driver. The tow truck driver is the helper. How many know that he is not less than because he's helping? It's, Eve isn't created for Adam as a matter of convenience, it's a matter of survival. That he needs her. He, he needs the helper that is just right. He needs someone. He, he can't go alone. He's, he's going crazy just talking to the animals. He's going crazy just, just sitting there in his thoughts. He needs another person. He needs a helper who is just right. So God gives him Eve. And Adam and Eve, they're, they're in the garden. And it's perfect. There's all the animals and there's all the food. It says that they're naked and felt no shame. It's, it's, it's a perfect world and then what happens they go to the tree and they eat some fruit from the tree the one thing that that god said do not do this and what happens instantly shame enters the scene instantly it it sin it starts whispering in the ear it starts comparing it's it's like this comparison between the man and the woman this right here when they eat the fruit this is where like the battle of the sexes begins because before this God created Eve in his image. God created Adam in his image. They're, they're equal. We're, we need each other, but now we start comparing ourselves to the other person. 
Now we start saying, well, what do I bring to it? What do they bring to it? How, how, how does it? No, this is where the battle of sexes begins. This was not God's intent that one would be looked at as more, one would be looked at as less. It's we're made in the image of God, each and every person. So we see that, number one, the purpose of marriage is to be joined emotionally. Point number two, the purpose of marriage is to be joined physically. So we see through the soul and through the body. I want you to know this morning that God wants you to be joined with your spouse physically. This is his plan, that a husband and a wife would be joined together physically. And maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, uh, okay, that's just through holding hands, or that's through hugging, or that's through kissing. But what we see here in the Bible is that the two are joined physically through sex. Did you know this morning that sex was God's idea? It was God's plan. He invented sex. And what we see through Genesis is God creates something and says it is what? Good, it's good, it's good. God creates sex, which means this, sex is good. Go ahead, on the count of three, everybody say sex is good. One, two, three. Some people are like, can we say that in church? I don't know if this is okay. No, we see it's, it's good. God created it, it says he blessed them said, be fruitful and multiply. I don't know about you, I've never received a blessing that wasn't good, right? Oh, I'm blessed with this debt. Ah, I'm blessed by it. Oh, I'm blessed with all these toys. Oh, I'm blessed with it. No, we're not blessed with things that aren't good. It is a good thing. God created it. God invented it. He said, it is good. He made male. He made female. He said, this is what I want you to do. This is his, you look through the Bible, this is his first command to humanity. It wasn't to, hey, go pray, or hey, go, go do this. No, he said, God made them male and female. He blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. It's a good thing. And I know sometimes in, in the church world, it, it gets looked at as like, that's dirty, that's inappropriate, we shouldn't talk about that. It's like some of you, when I said to, to say that out loud, you're like, ah, I don't know if I can say that word in church. Right, it, it gets looked at like that, why? Because God created it, which means it's good, but anytime God creates something that's good, Satan tries to pervert it. Satan tries to twist it. He, he, he gets you to question it. He does this with Adam and Eve. We're gonna look at this next week. At the tree, he says, did God really say that? Are you, are you sure that's what God meant? So God creates sex, he's, he blesses them, he says it's good, he says this is what you should do, this is, this is a way to be joined, and Satan comes in and he twists it and he perverts it. But hear me, God designed sex, which means God defines sex. This is the problem that we have. This is why it feels like it's dirty or inappropriate to say this because culture says a lot of lies. They're always trying to twist what God says is good. Because while God says sex is good, here's what culture says, sex is God. Don't believe me, turn the TV on. Don't believe me, scroll through social media. Don't believe me, turn the radio on. It's everywhere. And the problem that we have in our culture today is that we're allowing culture to define something they did not design. We're saying, hey, you, you can tell us how to use this, but what do we see, who, who designed sex? Who designed marriage? God. It's his design, he defines it. He said, I made male and female. I made a man and I made a woman. I made them, I define them. Hear me, I don't define me. I don't get to define who I am or, or what, no, God defines me. You don't define me. My social media followers don't define me. Culture doesn't define me. God designed me, he defines me. God designed marriage, he said marriage it's for one man and one woman. Sex, it's for one man and one woman who are married. He designed it, he defines it. He says it's not for three people. It's not for two, gay, or two guys, it's not for two girls. He says it's not for you and your cell phone. It's not for you, no, we, we laugh, but man, culture, we, we're in a, in a, if you haven't found a Sunday school class to get plugged into, in the chapel, the youth team is going through culture and teens. And last week we talked a whole class about pornography. They say that 80% of students before they turn 17 will somehow encounter pornography. And I know sometimes in church culture it gets looked at like that's a guy's problem, one in three users are female. 
This is a problem. This is a problem with, with teenagers. This is a problem with, with adults. That we've allowed culture to come in and, and culture whisper and culture tells, well, this is who you really are. Oh, you don't feel comfortable? Well, maybe because you aren't that person. No, God designed it. God designed marriage. God designed sex. And because he designed it, he what? He defines it. He defines it. There, there's, there's a problem that we have that we're using something that God created wrong. Understand that, that we have all the pieces. Culture has all the pieces to use what God created the right way. And I wanna remind some people this morning, I, I feel led to, to talk about this. Sometimes we look at our culture today and we think, well, this is, this is just how bad our world has gotten. Did you know that you go through the Bible, this is not just like a new problem. You look at Nineveh, you look at Solomon and Gomorrah, there are problems in the Bible, but guess what? We serve a God who is bigger, we serve a God who is greater, a God who is stronger, a God who speaks and something happens. So therefore, we don't just have to sit around and wait and say, oh man, the end of the world is coming. No, we sit here and we pray, God, change our nation. God, change our city. God, change my family. God, change this world. Let's stop just sitting and waiting for the end and let's be active saying, God moved in the Old Testament, God's moved in the New Testament and he can move today. He can do it today. We have, we have all the right, God tells us, I designed it, I define it. And here's how to use it. He gives us this instruction manual. He says, this is how I want you to use it. Daniel, how are those uh, Legos coming over here? He sorted it by color. I got some things that clearly go together. Can you just like show the, show the lovely people here this morning what you've created? These things clearly go together, so I got them connected. These pieces clearly connect because they're ball and joint, but that's about it. A couple pieces here, maybe a flower. So I gave you this piece, and I'm gonna be honest with you. My five-year-old takes about 10 minutes to do this Lego set. I bet he does. Granted, he has the instruction book. And while this is what you created, this is what it was supposed to be. Almost. Almost. It says six plus. I don't know how old you are, Daniel. I'm guessing you're older than six. Yeah, a little bit. But this is not the intent here. This was not the end goal here. What we see here is Daniel has all the right pieces. He has all the pieces here. I didn't take a piece out. I didn't hide a piece. He has all the pieces. He just didn't have the instruction book. The world, everywhere around us, we have the right pieces. You have the right pieces for a healthy marriage. You have the right pieces for healthy sex. But what we see is that we aren't following the instruction manual. Therefore, we sit here and we say, well, I tried to create something and this is what it is and it doesn't look how it was intended. The creator of this Lego set did not intend it to look like this. That's not the intention. And honestly, I could have given you, I thought about this, but I felt like this was gonna be cruel. I could have given you the instruction book and taken one page out and he would have started creating something and it might have looked almost exactly like that, but you know what would have happened if he didn't have all the right pieces? It wouldn't have functioned exactly how it was supposed to function. It didn't operate exactly how it was supposed to operate. There was something left over, there was something to say, something's out of place here. Listen church, God designed sex, he designed marriage, he defines it. We need to be a church, we need to be a people that we follow the instruction manual that we follow, what, what does he say about it? How should it be used? This is how it's to be used. Give it up for Daniel this morning for helping us out. So we see that the purpose of marriage is to be what? Joined, say joined. I want you to leave here with knowing that this morning. The purpose of marriage is to be what? That was weak, one more time. The purpose of marriage is to be what? Joined. joined. Thank you, Pastor August. I've been waiting for him to say that all morning. Joined. We see joined emotionally. We see joined physically. And the third and final point we see this morning is to be joined spiritually. To be joined spiritually, we see soul, body, and spirit. Understand this, church, if, if you're taking notes, I, I want you to write this down this morning. Marriage 
It's an illustration of the loving and intimate relationship between Christ and his church. Marriage, our earthly marriage is an illustration of the loving and intimate relationship between Christ and his church. It's, it's him proving, it's him showing us, it's him giving us a perfect example. Like I just illustrated for you the pieces and, and needing the instruction manual. This marriage between a husband and a wife, it's an illustration that God uses. That, that he wants you to know how much he loves his church. It's easy to look at marriage and, and see it as, uh, well, they're just a person uh, for me to have a, a emotional relationship with. Or it's just a person for me to have a physical relationship. It's just purpose of marriage is procreation. Those things are there, those things are vital, but that doesn't, that's not it. If we, if we miss this point, we're, we're missing the, the main point here. Look at Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five, I think we should have it on the screen. Starting in verse 21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. The problem here is that lots of times that's where people stop reading. Verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man, this is what we've been reading, a man leaves his father and mother to be united, to be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Hear me, just as a marriage is, is public, that a, that a husband leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, just as it's intimate that the, the two become one, just as it's exclusive and lasting that husbands hold fast to your wife, Christ's relationship with the church is the same. It's public. He died on a cross. It's intimate, it's, it's with you. His relationship isn't just with a building, it's, it's with you as a person. It's lasting. It's exclusive, it's going on forever. This is Christ's love for us. Marriage, the purpose of marriage, it's to illustrate Christ's love for his church. It's to illustrate Christ's love for you. Would you stand with me all across the room this morning? It's to illustrate it. Wives submit to your husbands just as church submits to Christ. Husbands, Love your wives, serve your wives, just as he did for the church. He, he went to a cross, died on a cross for us, for you, for me, for sinners who are gonna continue sinning, who aren't perfect. That's love. That's a crazy love. Crazy that, that he did that for us. And this is, this is what he wants, is, is he wants relationship with us, he wants relationship with you. And just as Adam was in the garden and Adam was alone, it was Adam and the animals. And God realizes there, he needs a helper. He needs a helper that's just right. What I love is that we see that when Jesus comes to earth and, and he dies on the cross, he rises again from, from the dead. And he's talking to them. He says, it's better that I go. It's better that I go because I'm gonna send you someone who's better. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, it says, helps us in our weakness. Just as Adam needed help, we today need help and he's given us help, the Holy Spirit. This whole purpose of marriage is to show us Christ's love for his church. In, in Genesis, we see the story about Adam, the first Adam. And Adam, needed help. He couldn't do it alone, so God lays him down, and out of his side, he takes a rib and creates the wife. Jesus, his bride's the church, goes to the cross, pierced in the side for his wife, for his bride, the church. 
Adam's known as the first Adam, Jesus is known as the second Adam, or I like to say the, the last Adam. The first Adam, in an act of disobedience, went to a tree and brought sin into the world. The last Adam went to a tree called the cross in an act of obedience brought forgiveness. And forgiveness isn't just this. I want you to know that, that it's more than just forgiving. It's more than he just wants to say, oh, like, sorry, it's okay, like how we teach kids. No, it's totally wiping it clean. It's total justification. His blood washes us white as snow. So you may have come in today and you've been struggling. You've been struggling with anger. You've been struggling with, with lying, with, with stealing. You've been struggling with an addiction, addiction to pornography, addiction to a, a substance. And you come in and in just a moment, you're gonna have an opportunity to respond and, and say, God, I, I need you, God, forgive me. I want you to know that it's more than him saying, it's okay, I forgive you. And then we leave and we continue going back. No, we are justified just as if we never sinned. He washes us new and we change as we leave the door. But it takes us being honest. It takes us being real. We, too often in church, we pretend to be someone who's got it all together. Oh, I walk in and there was stuff going on at home. There's stuff going on in the car, but we walk in and look at us. We're just this perfect family. We got everything going together. It's been a great week. I'm blessed and highly favored. We say all these types of things and they're true, but really what's going on is, yeah, it's good except I can't stop looking at these videos. It's good, except we can't stop arguing. It's good, except I can't stop lying. It's good, except I, I can't, and, and we pretend to be someone so it looks like we got all together, and then we leave, and we never leave changed. We say, God bless me, God bless my family, God bless my business, God bless finances. And God's saying, I want to bless you, but I can't bless who you're pretending to be. I can only bless who you really are. Who are you? Who are you really? Because I can't change that fake person. I can change you, though. And this morning, you know, I'm, I'm preaching in here, my, my dad's preaching over there. We spent some time just prepping together for this week, separate for this week. And we both just felt like this, man, today's altar is gonna look very broad. Today's response, it's very broad. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray and, and maybe you're responding today and your marriage is struggling. And you say, man, we, we just need, we need God. We, we, we need to be reminded that that God is the center of this man. We need, we need him to move. Maybe it's good, but it's not great. And you're responding saying, I need this to be great. Maybe you came in this morning, your marriage, it's great. And you're saying, I wanna remind myself that my marriage is great because it's centered on Christ. Maybe the response for you today is this, is it's, a, it's by yourself. It's saying, man, I'm struggling. I'm struggling through addiction. I'm struggling through pain, I'm struggling through hurt, and, and he wants to work through that, and it's time maybe for the first time that you get honest about what you're going through. Maybe today you're responding and saying, man, I've yet to submit, I've yet to give my life to Christ, like, like he's saying the church should submit to him, I've yet to submit, and now I'm going to submit, I'm going to start following him. But here's what we're saying today, we're saying that God, I'm following your plans, I'm following your purpose, what you say is true, and I'm submitting to that. So here's what I'm gonna do today, church. I'm gonna pray. When I say amen, the prayer team, you guys can come on down. If you want prayer specifically for something, the prayer team will be down here and they, they wanna pray over you. Maybe it's you and a spouse, maybe it's just you by yourself, maybe it's you and your whole family, and they're gonna be off to the sides and, and either corner. So prayer team, if you're in here, then you're gonna go off to the sides. And if, if you want prayer, you can go up to them specifically. Maybe you're just responding, saying, man, I just need to respond. I just, I just need to, to step out. I just need to, to get honest. And, and this middle area, if you just want to respond and just say like, God, I, I'm responding to you. God, I'm submitting to you. We're submitting to you. This area is open for you. But I'm going to pray. When I say amen, the worship team, they're just going to lead us in the time of worship. And I challenge you, let's respond this morning. What's God speaking to you? What's he, what's he pushing you towards? God, I thank you that you're a good God. I thank you that your word is true. I thank you that, that your plans and your purposes, that they're so much greater than we could ever imagine, that we could ever think. God, I pray this morning that that you would restore marriages that are struggling. I pray this morning that you would restore people who in this room who are, who are struggling, God, that you would begin to work, that maybe as the first time that they've ever been honest about something, that they would get honest, they would get real, and that you would begin to change them from the inside out, God. God, I thank you that, that you're a good God. I thank you that you're a faithful God, that as we read in Genesis before, that when you speak, something happens. I pray that you would speak today. We love you, we thank you, and we pray, amen.